Hey guys, it's me, Maxi Rainbow. And I am Renata from the eSpot. And welcome back to episode 29 of the Joint Slay podcast. We are really excited because in this episode, we are finishing off finally after weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, episode after episode, finally we will be finishing up our like reviews to all of the entries for Eurovision 2024. So we only have a few left that we will be covering in this episode, including Armenia, Georgia, and Australia, as well as some of the revamps that were released, such as Albania, Malta, Czechia, and Luxembourg. Okay, so we've got, you know, We've got still a, quite a bit to go through, but we are finishing it off, girl. And then after that, oh my God, there's, you know, I mean, there's going to be information piling through because mm -hmm. guess what? Uh, there are pre-parties and one of them has already happened, which we will discuss yeah. a little bit in this episode, which was pre-party España, which is uh, the pre-party in Madrid. I feel kind of bad for the Barcelona pre-party because pre-party España kind of implies that's the Spanish pre-party. But there's also Barcelona. There's also Barcelona. So, um, you know, shout out to her as well. But then we also have uh, some other things going on in the Eurovision sphere, such as these artist statements that came out this week, which were way too important for us not to cover in this episode. And it also, uh, you know, might relate a little bit to my current uh, situation with social media as well. So there's a lot going on in that regard. So there's a lot to go over in this episode. But before we get into that, of course, we want to give a shout out to our patrons. These are people who went over to patreon.com slash joint slay podcast and subscribe to get the full length video episodes early on Thursday, a day before the release, ad free full length videos with song clips included in both the video and the podcast version of the episode over there. And there is also some Patreon exclusive content that is sprinkled throughout that we have filmed in, you know, weeks and months past that you can also check out when you're subscribed over there. And another benefit that you get when you subscribe to the Patreon is a, a shout out at the beginning of the episode, like the following people. So shout out to Daniel, Obili, Alistair, Russell, Shoegazer, Daniel, Kathleen, Suniva, Norbert, Jackson, Penny, Andrew, Elliot, Sana, and Liza. So shout out to all of you guys who subscribed over on the Patreon and shout out to everybody who has been listening and watching the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. And yeah, without further ado, let's get right into the episode. Uh, but before I get into the episode, I, I should, I'm, I'm feeling a little hungry. Just... <gasps> Fuck off! No! <laughs> no! Mm. How dare you insult me with these Sour Patch Kids so gleefully eating the snack that has harmed me on this very day. Okay, guys. Maxi is holding up a pat packet of Sour Patch Kids, which are a little sour candy, like a little gummy candy. They're delicious. So, uh, right before we were about to film, I was like, I want a little sweet snack. And I grab some Sour Patch Kids. Although, actually, they're Sour Patch Kids straws. So, you know what I mean? Oh, so, they're like the, yeah. they're like the long, mm. like flat ones. So, they're not shaped like Sour Patch Kids, but they're like, mm -hmm. they, they taste exactly the same. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just different shape. And uh, I eat the Sour Patch Kid, throw the uh, wrapper into the trash can, and proceed to rub my eye with the finger that had just been holding the Sour Patch Kid. And mm. I just, I had not like licked the sugar powder off of my fingers. So I just straight up rubbed oh my God. sugar candy into my eye. And they are taunting me right now with this delicious candy. Well, and you know, that was really good, actually. That was like given blue raspberry. I didn't even know that was a color. That was the flavor was I had. Blue raspberry. That's what did it. That was delicious. And I, and I even have the blue eyeshadow, too. That's why. It's just something <laughs> about blue in my eyes. It's just a Yeah, it, it saw its brother sitting up there over on your eye. It like, just yeah. wanted to, you know, come forward. Well, um, I'm sorry about that. Um, but you know what? The show must go on. We mm -hmm. said we'll just wash those eyes out and keep it pushing. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all righty. So after we got our snacks, uh, the first entry to go over in this is Armenia with their song Yako by Ladaniva. Okay, so this was very interesting because there were a lot of room. First of all, you know who was going through the rumor mill in in the Eurosphere was Malena. Yeah. A lot of people were saying Malena was a potential this year. I think unfounded, probably. I think she just had posted that she was in L.A., but she's like always in L.A. So I don't I, I think that's all that it was. As a Malena stan, I keep up. Um, But I was I was excited at that prospect. But then uh, Ladeniva. I don't know if it's La Deniva. I think it's La Deniva. That's what it looks like to me. So that's what I'll go with. Um, they were the other one that was in the circle. And so when they were announced with their song, Yako, uh, I was so excited because to me, this is what I love. And this is what I fell in love with Eurovision was entries like this from Armenia. I remember when I first got into uh, Eurovision, one of the first entries I ever got obsessed with was uh John John. But I I I absolutely fell in love with that entry. And like, and then I remember like I got because I was so new to like uh European music or cultural music or world music, I got so obsessed and like thrown into all the Armenian uh cultural kind of cultural pop music like this. Um, uh, like uh, Siru Sirushu. Oh my god, I should not be saying people's names. She was in Eurovision as well. Um Kele Kele, uh, like she has some amazing music as well. Like that, like early years, maybe not early years, like that late 2000s years of Armenia where they were sending the girl bops that they were Armenian cultural. Oh my God, this is what I love. And I'm so excited with this entry. It's just everything I've I've wished for from Armenia for like the last decade. And I mean, they always slay. They always bring amazing entries every year. They're different from the last. Um, and this is even more different than all those other entries that they've done in years past as well. Um, but this one is exciting because it's very modern and it's also very cultural. And I just feel like, you know, it's nice to see that they do things that are not just this because I... I I feel bad whenever countries, it feels like they're being like pushed into that. Like Ukraine mm -hmm. always gets those types of comments like, oh, we, you know, they just that's all that people maybe want. Or then sometimes when they bring it, though, it's like, oh, this is all we ever get from this country. It's like, oh, my God, we can't fucking win. No. Um, but it's been so long since we had something like this from Armenia. And this is one that I feel like is going to really this could be a Trenolet tool, like get everybody up and jumping and excited and like unexpected. Um, maybe it doesn't have as much hype and excitement in the fandom right now, but this being performed live, I know is going to get people excited. So. Yeah, I thought this one was really nice. Um, I agree with you that there is sometimes this feeling that countries are kind of like encouraged to send a certain kind of song, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they're Eastern countries being encouraged to send certain kinds of songs and then not being appreciated when they do. Um, I totally agree. Um, I thought that this one really was successful in mixing the traditional elements and the modern elements. Cause it like, it didn't feel like with like Trinolet tool as an example like that one literally thematically even was like folklore, rock and roll, like two mm. very separate things. Um, and uh, even I felt maybe like with Kalush also, like you have the really traditional elements and you have the rapping part, mm. which are, you know, like very different and like foils to each other. Um, but I felt like not to say that that's, I'm, that's not a negative about either of those songs. I don't want it to be taken as that. But I thought this was done in a way where it didn't feel like it was like one and the other. It just felt like really good modern traditional. And uh, I feel like um, uh, Greece also is kind of in a similar situation this yeah. year. They're finally giving us what everyone has asked for um, with like 
uh, kind of like girl bop, you know, traditional elements. And that's another one that I think actually did it really successfully. Mm -hmm. So like the songs don't come off to me as being like, they just tried to send something that, you know, let that like check the boxes mm -hmm. of what people wanted. They feel like really authentic songs. Um, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because this song was not made for Eurovision. This is actually a song off of their album that came out, I believe, in September. So I don't know in, you know, in terms of the timeline when they were selected uh, versus when they picked the song. Like, I don't know. I, I doubt that they... I don't know. I always, I do wonder about that because it's like one thing for a national selection or whatever, but they weren't like announced or anything. Um, and who knows? I mean, they were they were actually announced so late. They were one of the last people to be announced for Eurovision. This was one of the last songs to be like announced. I was going to say released, but it had already been released. Um, but it was one of the last songs to be announced for Eurovision, but actually uh, was one of the first to come out now looking back because it came out in September. So oh, interesting. Yeah. So it's interesting that it's it's been out, it's existed, but maybe but maybe that was like, you know, what they were looking for was something that wasn't necessarily picked for Eurovision. Maybe that was the appeal. Maybe I, I wonder if they picked the artists and then they were like pick something off your album or come up with something. Like, you know, I wonder how those how those things go. Um but Oh, that is interesting. But, I hope someone asked that in an interview. We get maybe yeah. an answer. Or if somebody knows, if there's some Armenians in the comments, um, let us know if you know what the deal is with uh, them being chosen. Yeah, but I'm excited. Like, I agree. It feels very just authentic to them as artists. And um, they're not doing anything other than slaying and yeah. just having fun and I'm excited. I'm excited for this one for Armenia. Hope and they stage the ooh the way Armenia stages. You know they could stage. So I'm excited. Oh, yes. oh apricot stone girl. <laughs> I I'm excited too. Um and I will say since this is the first song we're hitting, I might as well announce I have started putting together my playlist of songs. So now I am doing the whole ranking process, finding the songs that I like getting rid of the songs that I don't like. And I am happy to say Armenia has made the list, in fact, very quickly uh, into my playlist for mm -hmm. Eurovision 2024. I'm loving it. I agree. It's in my top 10. So, all right. And then next up, we're staying in the caucus region, girl. We are going over to Georgia with their song Firefighter by Nutsa. And this one... Um, it's it's cooking for me, right? It's is there it are elements. It is because there are elements that replay, 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 replay in my mind, right? Um, namely, really the what out the fire, hey, what out the fire, hey, and there's this like there's this like like almost siren sound that plays, and then it has that drop. And she looks so, it's just her in the video where she's like got this sunset behind her in the black dress and she's like, put out the fire and she's sort of a face. That replays in my mind. But then the rest of the song is so forgotten to me. Like I really, that's the only part that I ever think about. And I honestly even find myself skipping the song to that part, enjoying it and then moving on to the next song. Mm. Um, I but I don't know what's not clicking. Like it does feel like they threw everything into it, but maybe that's the problem. Like maybe maybe there's nothing for me to grab onto because there's just a lot. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know in comparison to Armenia's song that we just talked about, whereas that one feels like really authentic and I and like obviously not made for Eurovision, this feels like the total opposite that like mm -hmm. it very much was made for Eurovision. And that just it just makes it feel like a little bit stale to me. Mm -hmm. Um and just not exciting. And I did like the video and I thought mm -hmm. like the video reminded me of um Eru's video so like where every mm -hmm. kind of tableau sort of it looked very editorial mm -hmm. and um so like the like the you know styling was working for me yeah um 
Although I was noticing when she was dancing in the video, she dances just fine. And, and like the, like, you know, the dance is not an easy dance to do, but it looked like she just is not really a dancer. Like she's someone who can dance. Mm -hmm. Like it looks like she was really trying hard to go through all the moves um, whereas if you're a really good dancer you're going to do it so naturally that it's going to look easy yeah whereas it just it looks like it was yeah. just like she was focusing on dancing and i just i hope to god if it is the case and i and i think it might be for her that they do not make her do all kinds of crazy dancing like if she's not chanel levels of like vocal ability while doing difficult dances then they need to just let her like sing the damn song yeah yeah i mean the good thing is she probably doesn't have to focus on vocals because she's got vocals down so you know she could put a little bit more focus into her dances but this was my concern when she was announced and 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 i said i was like i don't know why everybody's so excited like her music's like she just sings ballads it nothing was really exciting in her discography and everybody said don't worry she's not sending anything like any of her other music she's sending something fun something cunty something exciting and dancey and i was like oh well but why are we why are we going to Eurovision with something that's nothing like any of your other music? If yeah, this is, and I mean, it's not like you only got two songs. It's like you got a lot of songs and this is not like anything you've ever put out before. And so I think that, yeah, like that does kind of confirm that this was fully thought out as to being like, what can we do for Eurovision? What do people like in Eurovision? What do the gays like? What gets the gays excited? Um, and I, And I see that, but yeah. I'm worried for this one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it's clear that they really want to qualify. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they will. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, it'll be a good end cure. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think as far as like, even like Iru last year, like uh, this song probably does have a better chance. It has mm -hmm. lyrics that more or less make sense that you can follow um you know people know what a firefighter yeah. is like but yeah. the, the, you know the other lyrics and echo were kind of like but why is fire? she putting out the fire because she's so hot i guess what what she does does she not want to be hot hmm. why should we put out her flame that's a good point i don't know what's on fire so <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the lyrics are still a little nonsensical i don't know um but it's fine that's fine yeah. <laughs> all right and last up of the entries that we haven't covered at all is australia with their song one mekala one blood by electric fields um and so this was, they were highly, I mean, they, these are fan favorites and I'm kind of obsessed with Australia's narrative the last two years of just being like, you know what? We saw some great artists in our national selection over two or three years. So we're just going to pluck them from there. And I'm kind of obsessed with that concept. Um, but I remember this one, here's the issue when you're coming in as a fan favorite is that everybody's going to compare you to your last entry. But let's remember that the last time we saw Electric Fields was like five years ago, right? So they've developed, they've changed as artists, you know, uh, and and I, controversial opinion, like this a lot more than their entry from previously i think this is a lot better for me personally this one to me is aging better i mean i know it's only been a few weeks a few months no just a few weeks since the song has been you know within my music that i've been cycling through but this one gets better with each listen you notice those little details details with the instrumental the didgeridoo the cultural elements the language like all of these things they stick out and each listen you notice something different whereas with their other entry i felt like 
it was one that I liked a lot on first listen, but then my interest in it dissipated over time. It was they were never my winner back in the day. Um, I was never in the, you know, electric fields robbed, you know, feeling. Um, hey, what did what won that year for them? I believe that was Kate Miller Heidke Zero Gravity. Uh, I want to okay. say because they were in the first. I think that it was the first first um, time they did their national selection, okay. which she yeah. So, twenty nineteen, um, and. I love this. The, I, the oh hey, this is this is the issue. That damn music music video, the lyric video they put out, that was what turned everybody off. Um, because it was just it was just a little awkward. You're staring into their eyes for for three minutes, and they're it's like slow motion, and they're kind of like just bobbing their heads back and forth. I and thought like, the video was cute. What was cute about it? I don't know. I was like, well, if they're just going to do a lyric video, like, at, you know, it felt like, okay, so I watched this historic, like, facial reconstruction videos, and the, the p person who does these videos, like, when they do their, like, reconstruction, they put them through one of those, like, 3D modelers where, like, the, like, the faces kind of, like, gently move, so, and they, like, open their mouth and blink their eyes, you know what I'm talking about, to, like, sort of yeah. make the paintings yeah. come to life. And that's kind of what the video reminded me of. So I don't know. I, I, I wasn't put off by it at all. I thought it was fine. <laughs> yeah, I thought oh. it was cute. Okay. Well, we've, we've established I'm bald phobic. So I think right. that that is like, you know, uh, it could be an issue for me. Um, but yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the song? <laughs> um, I really liked it. So I didn't know... Um, I didn't know their other song. Mm. I knew that they had been in Australia Decides before, but I, I actually never watched Australia Decides. Um, so I'm not comparing it to anything, but it was kind of like the, the way that I felt after I watched it was sort of like, I feel like this could be like how Gustav was for me last year where it was like the first time I heard it, I was like, okay, like, this is like nice. It's like feel good music. Like it's got the kind of like, you know, like poppy club beat to it. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know, it feels good. And then I like, that's how I felt with Gustav. And then I ended up like totally loving because of you. Mm. So I feel like this might have the same like effect on me where it was like, you know, I wasn't like super wow the first time I heard it, but I certainly did, I, there was I, there weren't any pieces of it where I was like I don't think that part is working like I thought the mm. whole song was working well and like I was feeling it uh and I did put it in my playlist okay yeah and I mean that's the thing is their live is incredible like like the main singer when they're they're just one of those people that their live performances are just better than than mm when you hear the song they just bring this certain level of charisma and stage presence and intensity which was what was weird about the video because they didn't have that that i that i know that they can bring through their uh performance um and i feel like this one's got like those highs and lows to it in those moments that could be really amazing moments on the stage and i think that that's what's like maybe it's not clicking for people Oh my God, maybe it's not clicking for people because there's not really a visual or anything for us to really uh, cling on to right now. Mm -hmm. The lyric video was nothing. It was just them staring into the into the screen. So there really wasn't anything to go off of that. So uh, right now we just have the song, but I think the song is amazing because I feel like when I think of like, so their entry was 2000 and whatever. Um, and I just have an issue with these choruses that are like, so it was like happy two thousand and whatever, uh, 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 and it was like oh, nothing, okay. like nothing happened during the chorus, and I have an issue with that. Like those songs don't age well for me because it's just like okay, so when I'm listening to the song, I'm just gonna sit here. Like uh, when I'm singing along, I'm just gonna sit here. That's how I feel when songs just like repeat one word as the mm. chorus. Yeah. And so with this one, I feel like it's it's 
it's just interesting the whole way through. I think of like, you see, da, da, da. I, okay. <laughs> Whenever I go to sing it and then it's suddenly like, oh, I don't know the words at all. <laughs> but it's good. I love, I really do like this song. It's not my top 10, but it's hovering just below it. Um, and I'm excited to see what they do live. I am sad because I don't believe they're doing any of the pre-parties, which means we're not going to see them live. I mean, I understand not doing a pre-party unless it's like one of the last pre-parties and you're staying in Europe. Like Australia is just yeah. so far away. If you're going to do either do them all or, or do none, because it's yeah. just like, uh, yeah. I can't remember. I I don't know why. I feel like I feel like Australia did do the pre parties last year, but maybe they didn't. Um, they may have. They may have. Uh, but also, were they on tour at the time? That's I know what I was thinking. For Germany, sure, I was. No, yes, yeah. but they, they were on tour. I think in like South America too. So they yeah. like came back. Yeah, with that. that was wild. Yeah, but. Especially because um, they came like last and they're like, I know, really established. But were they? I mean, well, yeah. Okay. But for a specific type of music. So, yeah, I guess that's, that's true. It's like EDM. Like, I don't, I'm not in that world. So I don't really understand, you know, when things, when they're like, oh, this person's a big deal. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's great. Um, anyways. Uh, so, I mean, all those entries, really good. But then there's, okay, so there were these revamps, right, that came out. And there are a variety, a range of revamps that we've gotten uh, throughout the season. And, um, like, some of them have are more important, more impactful, more different, more changes than others. Um, and the one that I would say is the most changes is Albania. Different so song. <laughs> it's a completely different song, essentially. Um, so now it's called Titan, still by Bessa. Um, who followed me on Twitter? Rest in peace. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a completely different song, essentially. And I like the instrumental more. I think I really like the end of the song where it kind of picks up and there's this more poppy dancey element that comes in. Um, and and honestly, this song is fucking catchy. Like the way this song gets stuck in my head, the way I won't give up, I'll never break, like a titan, I'll be brave. Like, girl, that be ringing in my head like, yes, I, I will be a titan, okay? And then, rah, yeah, 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 yeah. like, it eats. But I'm not going to lie. When the old version comes on, I listen to it and I go, Ooh, I'm less likely to skip the old version than the new one, which isn't good. I just love the Albanian language and like totally understand her wanting to do like her, you know, go with whatever she wants to do as an artist. And, and I know that she's said like oh you know this song has grown it's developed into a completely new thing and so like this is what it is but there are certain parts that just like i really loved the albanian bits like i love the albanian rap i miss that like you know when you grow to like feel so comfortable and in, in, in love with what you have and then it's gone and uh but i still like it but i uh, I don't yeah I, yeah I I liked the old version I thought this version's okay um but it's not like I didn't put it on my playlist so it's not something that I really want to listen to a lot like every I feel like it's a lot like George's song um where it's like good like she's a good singer like the like message or or lyrics or whatever like is fine but um but it's just not necessarily like it just it just feels like i said with that uh with georgia it just feels a bit stale yeah like i mean like there's so many like inspirational kind of like power pop songs and you know, be tight and yeah. be brave and a little bit cliche. And mm -hmm. um, that's the thing. It's like the, 
the English translation does it no favors because it's like, oh, so we can understand how cliche it is. Yeah, although, you know, what I did like about the song was kind of like the end bit where it sort mm. of is a bit more like a like high tempo breakdown part. Mm. And I was like, fuck, like, why is the song over now? Like, why didn't they bring that in at like the beginning of the final third? No, I wish just an outro. Yeah, I mean, and like, it would have been great for the whole song to be like that. I feel like if they were going to revamp it to this level where it's like nearly a completely different song, like, I mean, you could also just, I mean, why not pull a fucking um, El Haida and do a whole new song? <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah. I don't um, know. I think it's okay. It might be one yeah. that grows on me. I don't mind it. It's just it, like, I like it. It's in my rotation, but it's just... um a shame because i really like bessa actually like she's she's really fun um but also i don't know what happened to her little um people were supposed to get early release of the song and she said i was supposed to get it and then she just released it <laughs> i mean maybe it's just decided not too I much know. work or whatever yeah i'm like girl okay <laughs> why i was like why'd you tell me <laughs> like that's fine but uh and then, okay. <clears throat> then we had some, okay. I, the rest of them, I feel like there are barely any changes. We have Malta with uh, Sarah Bonici loop. But okay, this is the issue with loop. This was the issue. The revamp is, okay. What we have at the end is amazing. I love it. I'm obsessed. It sounds so good. I've got it on, I've got it on loop, girl. Like I've got it on loop. and. I'm listening to this over and over again, and, and especially, I don't know what it is, the breakdown, the dance breakdown. Girl, I want to dance. I want to fucking dance. And what I love is there's a dance breakdown. Then we bring it back. We go back. We start singing again. Then we end it with another dance breakdown. I'm loving it. Um, but yeah, I don't really feel like there was much changes, but this is the issue. This song came out in October. We heard this song. Guys, Put this into perspective. This was the second song we heard in the entire year. It really? was it, running order. It was the first national selection. It was second song in the running order. So this was the second song in the entire season out of all national selection songs, out of all songs picked. Second song we heard as a fandom. It was one of the last to be released. That wow. is a total fumble because the revamp was not enough for us to have waited six months for that mm -hmm. revamp to finally come out the other issue there was already a revamp because when we heard it in the audition to when we heard it live there was a revamp and then we revamped it again can we just get the song right the first time i understand the auditions but mm -hmm. but it just but it sounds amazing, so I'm happy with what we got, but I do feel like there's a, a fumbled bag in there where you could have been collecting streams for six months. That's a great point, because they did kind of lose out on that, because I don't feel like the song is very different. And like when I was checking out the revamp, I thought to myself, like, geez, I feel like I don't really remember this song very well, because I can't tell if it feels like I'm listening to it for the first time uh, because they made a lot of changes or I feel like I'm listening to it for the first time because I just literally don't remember it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Cause I'm sitting here trying to think of like what was changed and I can't remember a single thing. Um, but it sounds good in the end. I like it. So I hope she keeps her flip. I hope to God she keeps her flip on the Eurovision stage. Cause that moment mm -hmm. is sick when she flips. Um, so yeah, then we had the revamp from Czechia with a uh, pedestal by Iko and okay. To me, this is bad. No, oh, sorry. This, my opinion that I'm about to say is bad. I dislike the song more after the revamp and the, re and here's my reasoning because barely anything changed, right? It's pretty much a production change. Uh, they censored it. 
And there's this moment in the song where she's like arguing. Um, I didn't like that either. I thought that was super weird when I went and listened to the Spotify version and it had yeah, the arguing. Thing I thought it was just for the video. I thought it was for the video too. So does that mean that thing is going to happen on stage? Like, is that? Yeah. I, I don't know how they would do that and it not feel weird. Yeah. Um, but my issue is it was, it's too clean and refined now and it's lost the angst that i feel like i had in the original the production yes it's slicker yes it's cleaner but maybe that's not what i wanted like maybe i wanted something that could just be like my angry yelling like you know like that's what that was what this song the emotion that it brought to me when i listened to it mm -hmm. and i was really listening to this song a lot it was again it was one of the first song selected this year and so it's been in my like on repeat since then like i've really loved this and since the revamp came out like it's fallen off for me i mean it was like really high in my rankings for a really long time and i mean it didn't necessarily drop but it's like well now i like a lot of other songs a lot more than this one um and yeah i mean i don't know i don't know why this one it's just like the revamp unclicked it mm, interesting and, yeah well that's really interesting criticism i don't disagree with it because i also don't like the whatever that talking portion is i don't understand like how what that like what that adds to the song and yeah. what like if it you know if it'll be part of the stage show however i love this song so much that I'm willing to completely overlook that I hate the change. Okay. I'm That's just, fair. I'm like literally just ignoring it. It's like, okay, well, it's that stupid thing that I don't like now, but. Um, yeah. I mean, we can, and I'm still listening to the old version. Luckily it's still on Spotify. So I'm still listening to that, but. Yeah. I might have to switch that one out from the Eurovision version um, that I put yeah. in my playlist. Um, but so for me right now, this song is actually tied to be my winner with three other songs so it like it may have unclicked for you but it locked in for me not hmm. because of the change like in spite of it like it's possible without that change like it might have been my like hmm. determinative winner hmm. but now it's like a shared placement okay what do you think of the censoring um from love me more than your bullshit to love me more than you once did I think that's like a pretty decent radio clean version. Yeah, I don't know why when I listen to it, it sounds like AI to me. <laughs> oh, it's like the like just the phrasing or the yeah, the way it's said because it's like it's like they're like squeezing it into this little part that's like love me more than you once did. Like <laughs> it it doesn't fit for me. Like. When I verbally said it, I was like, oh, that sounds good. But when I'm listening to it, something about it sounds weird. I don't know. It's just too clean, refined for me. The vocals are too perfect. Everything's too perfect. I'm worried about the vocals live. Yeah, you, like You are right about the way that it sounds so clean. Like it's sounding a little bit more like Olivia Rodrigo- yeah. And less bikini kill. It's very Hannah Mon it's very Hannah Montana Disney Channel angsty girl. Like it's not like proper, you know, paramore. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've lost but, some of the edge, but I still love the song. I love the song. I will be listening to the old version. Um I say all that. It's not like I hate it. I'm just Sometimes but, I, I mean, don't it's think criticism. Like, I mean, it's it just because there's things that aren't perfect about something doesn't mean that they're not mm -hmm. still good. Yeah. This is my other thing. These songs don't have to be clean for the album, do they? Or do they? Because Maybe they I do. was, yeah, because I was thinking like, mm, I mean, I guess that's a good idea because. uh Oh, yeah, because I was listening to Germany's song and it was censored, but they just bleeped it. And I was like, oh, that's a little awkward. Um, so I guess it's good that they did that. Because I was just thinking like, oh, if I could at least get this version with the swearing, you know, 
Like, why can't we have the clean version and the, you know, the Eurovision version can be the clean version. Can we get, you know, like, can, can we also get a cut without the music video? <laughs> like, can, can we get like a remix album also where, you know, we get uh, Bessa on a verse? No, <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess that makes sense. Cause I was just thinking like, I mean, sometimes maybe it's a new thing. Cause I feel like in years past, there weren't like, like somebody would have swearing in their song, but they just don't swear on the Eurovision stage. Um, but okay. <laughs> and then, um, then we, lastly of the revamps, we had Luxembourg with, uh, their song fighter by Tally. This is barely, like, this is really, truly barely anything changed. I mean, this is, like, the most minute of minute details. Maybe slight production changes. Also, there is some, like, extra instrumentals where it's, like, the, the French part where she's, like, there's, like, these really cool instrumentals in the background. Like, I really like that part. I remember originally, oh, you know what is really the, the grading difference? It's the is, spoken word part, right? That's new, isn't it? What's spoken word in this? There's like the come, I will never let you down. Yeah, that thing. Is no. that new? I don't think that's no. new. No, wait, no, I swear. Isn't there like a little spoken word part? You're not talking about the like. No, I think it was in English. Maybe it's Am the I come. I will never let you down. Where it goes blue and yeah, slow. Did, is it just because it got slowed down? Maybe that's. Is why it I... new? I don't know is if it? that's new. See, that's the thing. That's what's fucked up. Is it's like because like I I because I never really liked the song. So as soon as I heard it, it was like, ugh, ugh, this is that song I don't like. Yeah. So I couldn't really pick out the things that like were different. Yeah, I had her blocked a lot for a while on Spotify. So I wasn't listening to the song at all. Um, but here's the main difference that I remember is, um, so there's like these moments where it goes silent. Like it's like, uh, boom, like it just stops for a sec and then she comes back in. And originally there was like a kind of boom, like a sound, but now it just goes silent. Hmm. So I find that weird because there's just this weird moment of silence for like a split second. I wish the boom was back. Um, Dardust is a producer of the song. Dardust was an interval act in 2022. Dardust also is the producer on La Noia. So I don't know what, I don't want to know what Mr. Dardust did on this song. Uh, he clearly put his whole Dardussi into um, La Noia. Yeah, uh, which is a great song. But what I will say is I've been listening to this song a lot. Um, ever since I decided I'm going to listen to it, <laughs> I'm, I'm allowing myself to listen to it. It has started to kind of grow on me. And I don't know if it's the revamp. Maybe it was the revamp. Maybe it that did something for me. But I've been kind of enjoying it. It kind of is a lot of the type of music I like. Like, I like the mixture of languages. I like the, like, fast speaking rappy bits. Like, and I kind of like the video. I like when she's walking up the steps. I think it looks really cool. I don't understand her style, though. I need someone to explain why is she dressed in BDSM? Like, like why is she wearing patent uh, black like leather like why is she in a full latex bodysuit in that national final performance i'm a little confused by this choice <laughs> of styling um yeah i'm not getting that because it's not an edgy song at all it is not an edgy song yeah hmm. i don't know yeah, I mean, it, this one, again, it's sort of like with the Firefighter song, like, it just feels like it's, I don't know, like, oh, you're a fighter. Okay, you're a fighter. Like, I've heard a bunch of songs about being a fighter, being a, you know, a titan. And, like, I, I don't know, I feel like they're, in order to be, like, a really good inspirational song, there has to actually be, like, something that is, a little bit more powerful than just mm -hmm. saying that you're a fighter. 
Like I, yeah, I like in like poems pedestal and songs, is inspiring to me. Pedestal is inspiring. I feel like Poland song, The Tower, also mm, is yeah. similar because it's not just saying like I'm strong. It's like I I built a tower. Yeah, I have the power. Yeah. I built a tower. Like that you. I'm doing... learning to put myself on a pedestal. I'm, yeah. I don't know. There just seems to be something a little bit more. It's like... more authentic when it's that way, whereas when it's just like. It, yeah, hey guys, it, we're well, a fighter. Well, yes, it's like there is a level of a, an extra level of um, like uh, metaphor mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and it's also like more specific, so you can find a personal connection to it. Oh my god, like yeah, everybody's a fucking fighter and for something. Which I mean, yeah, it'll relate to everybody. But I mean, maybe when you're singing about confidence specifically or anxiety specifically, you know, those are things that people can actually be like, oh yes, I pinpoint that and I relate to that. And this is a song that I need in this moment, you know. Whereas, okay, I'm a titan, cool. But I do like this song. I think this one. I think this is a lock for qualifying. She did perform thing. it really well at the national yeah. final. Yeah. I think out of all of these ones in the revamp list, at least, I think this one is going through personally. But all right. And now that we have finished covering all of the songs, this is all the songs that have been released. So now all our opinions are out there to the world. Now we can get on to the fun stuff like... You know, maybe in a few episodes we can rank the songs, we can go over our favorites, etc. And we also have things like the pre-parties where we can watch the performances and talk about the things that are going on in the Eurovision world. Now, um, I didn't see... I, well, I did buy tickets to all the pre-parties. <laughs> Just to be safe, I thought I might be going. I'm not going. Um, but I did buy tickets. Uh, so I was supposed to be there. In in and, and so this is going to be a running theme, I think, through the next few weeks when we're watching things, specifically the free parties, because I had no plans to go to the actual live show. But um, I'm gonna have hella FOMO, hella FOMO for um these things. Uh, but the first one that happened was free party España, which is in Madrid. Um, so here's the order that they're going to go in, right? It's going to be pre party España in Madrid. Then it's going to be Barcelona. Then it's going to be Amsterdam. Then it's going to be London. And then I also heard that there's like a Nordic one, but I don't think that's a real pre party. I think that's like a, a Eurovision party. It's not it's, a pre party. I think it's like, past Eurovision artists not yeah it's current. yeah but they're advertising it as a pre-party which I don't think should be how it goes but that's just me um I think a pre-party should think that should be the artist of the year otherwise mm -hmm. otherwise it's I don't it's know just a Eurovision party like you said it's just yeah a, yeah yeah still sounds Nostal fun though nostalgia night really yeah yeah um but girl oh my god the Spanish y'all y'all just are so much fun like i was just watching these videos i was seeing everything going on seeing the artists like all interacting with each other it's just this is like when eurovision gets fun when they start making tiktoks together when they start posting photos together when interviews start coming out like this is fun this is exciting so girl madrid you really stepped it up this year yeah. because what the hell like why were these like why were some of these better staged than their national selections? Girl, these camera angles. Last year, they had two cameras. They had one on the audience, and then they had one on the artist. It was like nothing. Like, this year, girl, they had, like, proper, like, I was like, how did they, like, how did they rehearse this? Like, uh, what work? I think they're, the thing is, what people were saying is it it's it's just editing. Like, they just filmed them all and then they're just editing them together which is why not all of them have come out yet um so that whereas last sense. year it was just a live stream so it was like two cameras that they cut back and forth between this year they're like they took multiple videos from different angles and they're editing them together which is why some of these people have like crazy cool editing on their theirs 
Um, and I don't know if they have any direction in how that's being edited and put out or what, or if they're just, if the editor's just having fun or what. <laughs> well, and this was not live streamed, right? No. Yeah. Unfortunately yeah, that's, not. I think that was smart because it, yeah. they could do more. Like I'm sure they saved a lot of money by not live streaming. And then they were able to use that money to pay someone to edit all these videos because it was that's cool. True. Although that damn robot camera creature that they had rolling around the stage oh my god that was hilarious and like it <laughs> it, it, was, it was just so funny to like see it in pictures and there's mm. in a few of the videos you can kind of see it like rolling around in the back i don't know yeah. if you ever saw the show battle bots but it was like this show where people like made these robots and they would like fight in an octagon mm. um and that was just what I kept thinking about battle bots as I saw this <laughs> little like robot thing rolling around the stage. Um, but that was really smart because that gave us like really cool, like yeah. low uh, atmospheric cinematic angles. That Yeah. And like from behind too. Yeah. And it was, it was really good. I'm really love. I mean, the only thing is I need these videos to come out a little faster, <laughs> girl, because it's been several days. I want to see these. But there, you know what else there was? I'm like, this was where my FOMO came in. The first night was on Thursday. You know what they did on Thursday? Fucking Eurovision costume party. Bro, like the way, tell me why, like the way that's literally my thing. The way that's literally my thing. Yeah, you would have won and the I, costume they, contest. No, and they inspired by me, bitch, because last year I showed up looking like Blanca Paloma, ran into Blanca Paloma in the in the uh, foyer, uh, and um, inspired by me. That they that was inspired by me. Um, but so I'm gonna have to go to Madrid next year. Like I, I don't care. It's the best. It's literally the best. It's and it's and I what I love is that it's new, and like you know they're coming out with a bang you know yeah. these last I, so i think this was only the third year every year they're improving every year they're doing things different and better like it just looked like so much fun everybody that i knew that went just had an amazing time so and yeah the spanish people are just fun i'm telling y'all as a person who went to some of the pre-parties last year the spanish people are the most fun audience not like the dutch no offense to the dutch y'all know i love me my dutchies um, but y'all were boring. Y'all were boring in that audience. The Spanish people are fun. Love them or hate them, but they are passionate people. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> and you can tell. And they fucking love to party. They love to party. So just overall, the atmosphere looked amazing. Um, and then girl Maria Isabel was there. Do you know who that is? I don't. Junior Eurovision 2005 icon. And don't do that face, Renata. Don't do that face because not too much. Because I'm telling you, this is the most successful Eurovision artist of all time. Really? I'm telling wow. you. Good when I her. tell you that. Actually, that's not true because maybe Molly Sandin. Um, actually. Pretty successful. But yeah. she's pretty su Best, most successful winner. I'll say most successful Euro Junior Eurovision song because her song Ante Muerta Que Sencilla is a cultural phenomenon in Spanish speaking countries. I'd rather be dead than basic. That eight year old ate that up and that came wow. from the time that the kids were writing their own songs. She killed that. <laughs> I'm telling you if there's ever a Junior Eurovision song to go back in time and watch, she had this fan and she was serving. Oh my God, maybe I should do a reaction to that because I wanted to do some like older stuff. Yes, I'm telling you. And it was so cool to see her because I mean, she won so long ago and she hasn't really done, I mean, she did an album when she was a kid, but she hasn't done a lot of music since. So I was like, wait, they got Maria Isabel. Okay. <laughs> Pissed. Pissed I didn't see that, but all right. Um, and yeah, so uh, then uh, there were just some performances that, I went through, you know, first of all, they haven't posted all of them. So this is just who's been posted. But there's been some crazy changes even to the odds because of these. Because I think what's fun about the um, the pre-parties is that, you know, some of these people we've seen live a million times because we watched them in semifinals. You know, we've seen them perform. But then some of these people 
we have been left wondering what are their live performances going to look like? How are they going to pull off these songs? Some of them have really challenging songs to sing. And we're like, you know, how's this going to turn out? Um, and the big one, the big one to come from this, which has so far altered the odds insanely, is Switzerland, Nemo. Um, so Nemo, that song is probably the, I, it might be the most uh, difficult song to pull off live. I'm trying to think of maybe Greece is probably a hard one. Um, Slovenia that, probably kind of hard. Slovenia, yeah, yeah. Um, but this one is insane. I mean, the rap, the opera, the high notes, everything. And wow, I mean, nearly flawless. It was so good. Their energy was amazing on the stage. Um, they literally were like, I want to say sixth or seventh in the odds, maybe fifth, fifth, sixth, seven, like that. Immediately jumped to first place. Like, that is insane. That was like, I mean, granted, this is a free party, right? So who knows what they're going to do on the Eurovision stage. Mm -hmm. But it's giving the energy of like Fuego. Remember when Fuego just that that rehearsal dropped and everybody said, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. And that's the energy I'm getting right now. And I'm excited because like I said in the last episode, Girl Switzerland clicked. And so for me to have that realization and now to this, I'm loving to see it's clicking for everyone else too. It's not clicking for me yet. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's not clicking for me yet. Um, It's just, he's just doing so much. Hmm. There's just so much. There's so many parts and <sighs> It has it just hasn't won me over. Like the performance didn't make me love the song anymore. Mm. It, uh, I, like it was it was an amazing performance, hard song to sing. But it's kind of one of those things where it's like, um, it's sort of like in the figure skating world right now. Uh, the the skating has gone really towards like jumps. How many mm. rotations can you get on your jump? And everybody's trying to get these quadruple jumps, whereas it used to just be like doubles and triples. And now mm. it's like, how many times can you spin and jump? And like a lot of the kind of like the movement and stuff, you you lose it because everyone's just trying to do these big tricks mm. all the time. Mm. And I feel like this song just feels like he's trying to do quadruple jumps throughout the entire song. And it's like, just like, you don't have to work so hard. Just dial it back a little bit. Like, I don't know. It just, there's like a level of intensity. This, this song that just is, I don't know. I think that's what's keeping me from enjoying it. It's just like pulling me here and pushing mm. me there instead uh, of just taking me for a ride. Yeah, I get you. I All those things are reasons why I love it. <laughs> okay. I love it. I just, it's so dramatic. It's so intense, but in a way that doesn't feel, I don't know. I guess for me, it doesn't feel inauthentic, like, like, a uh, um, France, uh, because for me, that one, like, you know, when he does that, have you been seeing that damn performance where he steps, steps back, back away back from, from the, oh, mic it's like, just shut up, just stop, just stop. Seriously. Like, I'm done because that is truly just a vocal performance song. I mean, even the people who have France as its winner, even the France lovers, I see them saying, yeah, it's not the most impressive song in terms of like what it's singing about. Yeah, it's just a basic ballad, but his voice. Well, bitch, emphasis on Eurovision song contest, girl. Mm -hmm. Whereas, but this one actually has a perspective. It has something to say. It at, is a personal story specific to Nemo. Um, and so it's not just, and it, and all those things have reasons. The, there's reasons to why we're jumping from one genre to the next, one vocal range to the next. Like that all makes sense with the song. So that's why it's clicked for me. But I do understand um, 
your perspective. I do, because that was kind of where I was feeling when I first heard it. So we still got to wait a few more weeks. It took a few weeks for me. I'm I'm <laughs> holding out hope. Um, another one though was La Daniva. So to me, this was this was why I said um, earlier in this episode that this one's given me Trenolectual because the energy that she projected on that stage and the way that she was whistling with her fingers and and shouting and getting the crowd engaged and her facial expressions like she she just really knows how to like hype up the audience and get you excited and like that is the energy of the song I feel like I am at this like you know, festival in the middle of an old town and we're just all shut up. Like, that, it's just bringing me all the energy I need. Like, wow. Yeah, I was totally blown away by this because it's one of those things about, about the context of uh, pre-parties. Mm. So like you had mentioned about the ranking, Jumping Up with Nemo. Pre-parties are a great way to see the people who are going to be really good, like guaranteed to mm -hmm. be good on the main stage. Because if they can give us an incredible performance with absolutely yeah. no support, that's just like a stage and like the worst possible conditions for like vocals to be recorded, like in mm -hmm. a concert hall with like, you know, whatever sound deal you're dealing with. Um, so I don't think that pre-parties are a good way. Like if people have negative performances at pre-parties, I don't think you need, I don't think you should like remove like faith in them as performers or artists because there's so many other variables. But if people can really excel that, it's like you can get plus points in a pre-party, but I don't subtract points at the pre-party. Even mm -hmm. if like a performance yeah. is a flop, I don't, I don't hold a pre-party against somebody because there's so much that we don't know about that happens with pre-parties. Yeah, yeah, um, that's fair. I mean, I do a little bit, but I'll get to those. <laughs> um, this one was uh one where it was like, okay, this is gonna be fucking amazing. Like, there's no question. Like, once like they get to practice with cameras and all that stuff, like yeah. it's gonna be so good. Um. I this one got me really excited, like seeing this mm -hmm. live performance. Yeah. Yeah. Nemo and La Daniva so far are like the ones that really blew me away. I also thought that um <laughs> it was funny because I feel like specifically Ireland and Ukraine looked better on this stage than they did in their national finals for different well different same reasons whatever like both were like you know the just a lower budget kind of just you know not as much going on and so you know we don't want to judge them too harshly on on that sort of stuff but it was kind of funny that, that it low-key looked better on this stage which is also just better camera work better things to keep you interested in the performance and i mean they sounded good we've seen them both um in their national selections and both of them i mean they sound sounded good in their selections so they sounded good but it just has me excited for um for both of them at eurovision because i think both of these entries have kind of fallen off a little more for me so um so it was exciting to see them again live and be like reminded how amazing they are because i don't really go back and watch those live performances because they're not that good mm -hmm, not yeah. them they did fine but just the performances and like the stage like the lack thereof of staging like you know so like nobody ever goes to Moldovan auditions because they no. want to look at us, listen to a song. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, baby lasagna. I was hoping to see an improvement in the vocals. Didn't see it yet, but also that does all come down to, like you said, I guess like the mixing and the production at Eurovision is going to be so different. So, um, he didn't sound worse so that's good <laughs> you know like there's nothing negative in that sense i just was hoping to see an improvement but um but the energy of the crowd was insane i mean he clearly had everybody fucking excited and that's what's so cool about the pre-parties too is like you've got this croatian dude getting everybody in spain all these spanish people like screaming out his song and like so excited like that is so cool to see um, and this was one where I thought, ooh, okay. I kind of was starting to be like, why is this the winner? Like right now in the odds, like why is this the winner in the odds? 
And after I saw this, I was like, oh, okay, I'm seeing the winner energy. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm seeing it. So. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I really liked about this performance was that I could get a really good sense of what he is like as like a live performer, not mm-hmm. a live or television show performer, which is what Eurovision is, is a television show. Uh, so like I was watching this and I was like, I would a hundred percent go to his concert based on what I'm seeing here and how he works with the crowd and just like the way he performs. Mm. Um, And that's another thing that I like about the pre-parties is it gives a better sense of what these artists are like when they're actually doing gigs. Yeah. Because in reality, if I ever do get to see them, it'll be in a context of gigs. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of it's like nice to see that like okay and granted because i like baby lasagna i probably if he came to washington dc i'd go but oh hell yeah but like i i absolutely would like have i would have to go like i would make sure to buy my tickets immediately because like i can see that it would be really good um yeah so i'm just as excited about this one i think as i was it hasn't like fallen off at all for me yeah anybody else that you really loved uh from what you saw so far uh, yeah, Portugal was amazing. Mm-hmm. And again, like when you don't have anything else to like support yeah. your performance, like she didn't yeah, have she had her dancers. Yeah. Just as powerful, just as good. So that one was great. And also Luke Telk, Sylvester Belt, holy yeah. shit. His vocals sounded so good. And his like his whole like energy and and vibe like he made it look like it was so easy like he was just up there and just like doing the damn thing. Yeah. And I, this actually based on this performance, I was like, okay, this song is going into my mm. this is this is tied for winner for me. This is one of the four songs tied for winner for me right now because like I already really liked it. It was already top ten, top five material. Um, but I was like, do you know what? That like this clicked for me hardcore Ooh, when I okay. watched this particular live performance at the pre-party. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's amazing. He's what you know, and he. That's the sad thing. Well, maybe it's not sad, but I mean, it's like those ones that don't have maybe crazy showy vocals or whatever often get swept un- under the rug for the amazing vocalists that they are. Like, he's an amazing vocalist. Mm-hmm. We've never heard him sound off ever in all his performances yeah. in the National Selection and here, like, he's amazing. So, you know, let's hear some more hype for Sylvester and his vocals. Hell yeah. And that's Hello? probably what, actually, I do like about him, though, is that his vocals are very subdued because, as you know, I get annoyed by over-the-top vocal moments. Yeah. So I like that he's just like singing a song I, and it's kind of like Ruta Murr last year with Solo. Yeah. There was no like wild out of control vocal moment. It was just like just okay. singing the fucking mm-hmm. song and and just like like the subtlety of the vocals. I appreciate subtlety a lot more than I appreciate mm. like the in your face type of vocal style. Yeah. Also, I just need to give a shout out to Raven, Veronica, because... I had no doubt in her abilities as a singer because she's one that is literally, it's your job. It is, you are an opera singer who goes and tours and, and like does proper, like actual work as a singer. And we've heard her in the national selection. She's always been good. So I don't know why people were saying that she wouldn't be able to pull off this song live. She pulled it off. Yeah. Um, and I was, she could. Yeah. And I was kind of obsessed with the fact that she had a dancer on that stage with her and there was a little sapphic sapphic Mm -hmm. moment. I was like, okay, maybe it's given us a little hint into what the staging will be like in Malma. I was impressed with how many fucking people brought dancers um, because it ain't cheap. Like, so these pre parties, y'all bring in dancers. Now, it's one thing if you're like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of somebody who like needs dancers. Like, okay, maybe, maybe, uh, 
uh, Sarah Bonici. Like maybe like sh so much of hers has dancing moments that maybe that makes more sense. But like some like I wasn't expecting to see a dancer with Raven, you know, mm -hmm, right? Like I wasn't expecting to see that. So it was really cool to see that people are taking these really seriously. Um, and, you know, I think that they really are good opportunities, especially with ones like this that are overly produced, like, <clears throat> oh, but uh, Israel Calling, back in the day, they had a really good pre-party in that sense, because it was like on a huge stage. It was it was high production. It was like an actual Eurovision. Um, and, you know, we don't have Israel Calling anymore, thank God. So we... I'd be happy if uh, Madrid took that up. Uh, although not so much because I really like it in this uh, this arena. I would like it to stay there because I want to go again and it's really nice there. <laughs> and, and I like the idea of the pre-parties actually being in more like concert type mm -hmm. venues. Like yeah. I get the, like there is a great appeal of like the really slick, you know, Eurovision-esque stage. But mm -hmm. uh, it's I feel like, but we have Eurovision for that. Yeah. Like the yeah, pre-party is, it, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. It just something seems a little bit more like, or not more anything, less formal. It just seems less formal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it should be a place for, uh, you know, people to be able to practice as well. And like, you know, iron out any issues because yeah, it's not so serious. Yeah. I mean, and there were some, you know, okay. Not to be negative, but to be negative. Um, well, this isn't really negative. Uh, Kayleen Kaleen from Austria. Oh my God, this performance girl is going to perform the hell out of the song. We knew it. We knew it. And I'm excited because she was fucking serving. And the way she was like, Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> and she was talking to the audience. I'm obsessed with her voice. The vocals, here's the thing. The vocals were not, they were not like the studio track. I don't, actually know if they were bad or if they were just not like the studio track you know what i mean yeah, um well, i her... think the vocals was the only thing that wasn't good yeah but and i don't know i i to me like this is again one of those things where it's like i don't i'm not gonna like take points off for that mm. because it is this casual environment yeah this gig you know, concert venue environment. Um, but yeah, the the vocals weren't good, but I did love everything else. So I think like, you know, whatever, like it wasn't her best night vocally. Yeah. Fine. She was wearing that damn high, high slit, uh, not slit, but like high cut uh, bod like bodysuit, ass fully out, ass fully, fully out. That was out. a thong. Yeah. That was like in the crack ass out she was in spain and she knew what she could get away with she, in spain exactly Sophia Cole, did up. you see what Sophia Cole wore on the red carpet no nope. she had the, a, a dress that was like cut out like under the bust and okay. she had like pasties on i love it this is why i love the spanish because lord knows my ass was fully naked when i was in spain i was wearing dominico uh which i have next to me right now uh and this dress is what i wore to spain last year fully lace fully oh lace God, love that fully see-through spanish lace spanish designer the only thing covering my privates was uh, a, a thong that's hanging because it's connected to the dress oh my god it was a thong that was the only thing so off the runway dominico yes um but yeah so you could get away with it in spain mm -hmm. um but the other one was, okay, this is the one that I was anticipating seeing live because to me, this is such a live performance song. And that was Belgium, uh, Musti. And I was, I was, I was kind of shocked at how much he was kind of struggling um to hit the notes and he was really quiet i mean like he was so quiet i couldn't even hear him half the time yeah like and during those verses like truly like it was like are you singing like girl where was it and i just was shocked because to me this is like a vocal song mm -hmm. like this is one of those songs that you kind of gotta really hit those notes or else you know you can't hide behind like dancing it being a fun dance song like this is a vocal song 
Um, I'm not gonna lie, like I'm kind of worried for for him with this after this. Um, also, just the performance. Something wasn't clicking for me. Um, I don't know. This one wasn't working at all. Uh, me. Yeah, I mean, it didn't like make me like love the song, you know, where it wasn't like, oh, like super memorable or particularly well executed. I thought it was weird that his vocals were so quiet. And I didn't know if that was something going on with the mixing. Uh, maybe he couldn't hear himself, so he wasn't trying to like belt things out if he couldn't actually hear what he sounded like. Um, mm. I feel like the song itself, though, is like it's a bit of a grower, not just like over time, but like when you listen to the song, like it does like build in intensity as it goes along. And I don't know, it's hmm. starting to click a little bit more for me. Like I started to feel oh. a little bit and maybe it was actually because I wasn't hearing the vocals. So I was listening to the instrumentation more and the instrumentation was giving me Phil Collins. Hmm. Uh, it was it was giving me like that intensity of um, uh What's his famous song? In the air tonight. I can mm. feel it coming in the air tonight. Okay, yeah. Oh, no. And it had like that really nice like uh, bass line that just kind of like you can like feel like your heart beat mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. Um, and so like I, I felt like I was really digging the music a lot more because I wasn't hearing him as much. Yeah. I don't know. To me, this is one that is just one of those ones that is saying nothing. And my issue is when you're saying it so intensely, like the way he was, the way he was given it all in his, the way he was performing it, not in his vocals, but like he was like. With his like, body. Yeah. And in yeah, the video like, too, he was very physical. And so I'm watching that and I'm like, but okay, what are you saying? And then the way he's like, you know, he's get trying to get everybody to sing along, right? So then you're really listening to what you're saying and you're like, I got a soul on fire. I'm going to make moves tonight. What are you saying? I, I cannot get behind it. I can't feel that intensity. I can't feel that emotion that you're trying to give me. Like I see you're trying to pull that all out. But if there's not, girl, like Miss Dawn's is like Mr. Dawn is saying dawns is saying like it's given hollow it's given shallow it's <laughs> you know yeah. like well it's not what, giving what you just said about the like encouraging the audience to sing i hate that this happens at the pre-parties where like especially when after people finish singing their song they like no it, it that shit was pissing me off when i was oh, there live I, I hate every it. single one we just spent three minutes singing the song and then they go and one more time la -da 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 -da. i know we don't want to oh. do that come on y'all i get it because like as artists most of them like you're only going out and performing one song right so you want to like be out there for a little longer than three minutes i'd rather you just talk to the audience we just sat there for three minutes doing that we don't need that right and i feel like what ends up happening is it seems like there's this it starts to be a sense of everyone else was doing it so i should do it so it becomes like this mm -hmm. expectation that everyone's going to do it but as we know not all of the songs are like as loved as the other ones so then you have artists really trying to like get the and sometimes it's not like it's like you could have like a really like popular act go right before a less popular act and it's like they think yeah. that they're going to get the same response and then they don't because their song is just saying i've got a soul on fire i want to make moves tonight and you like, know sad it's like he was posting on his instagram before his performance and he was like everybody join in on the choir and it's like oh you're setting yourself up dude yeah, it's. I wish people would stop doing it. Also, it makes the shows go on so much longer. And granted, this one wasn't live streamed, but I remember 
when I was watching at home, just being like, oh, fuck, really? We're going to another? Okay, okay. Like, I'm already- I've Trust and believe on- live. Live, it felt like that, too. I'm telling you, when I was in that oh. audience, I was like, can we just move on? Can we move yeah. on? And it's and it and I'm sorry to say, but whenever it's that song that you really don't like, you're once you hit that moment, you're just like, get them off the stage, <laughs> right? Like I already had to listen to it, and yeah. now you want me to sing it? Yeah, um, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, <laughs> so I did have one flop in addition to the ones we just discussed, Mm -hmm. which pains me to say it because it's another one of my winners. Yeah, Yeah, it's Luna. Yeah. It it just, it did not come off. Same kind of thing with Moosey, just like the vocals were like really quiet. And like, and the thing that I do appreciate her though is she was someone who had a music stand, a microphone stand, Mm -hmm. which means she doesn't feel comfortable moving around the stage, but she does feel comfortable enough to just demand a mic stand. Mm. you know what I mean like I felt like I liked that because it just showed that she was like going to do what she felt like was going to be the best thing for her to do to sing the song Mm -hmm. unfortunately it did not seem to help her be able to sing the song very well um because it's just uh like vocally it's not great and that may be a something completely out of her control that was causing it to be off maybe she couldn't hear herself that well i don't know maybe the mix is bad and she actually sounded pretty okay inside um yeah yeah because what's I, concerning to me is this is this doesn't seem like a very vocally demanding song yeah so yes and uh, i get the sense after seeing this and seeing that she is an artist who prefers to sing with a microphone stand that poland is going to give us some kind of like I don't want to say over the top staging, but like they're going to they're going to pull some gag like she's going to have a big stage prop or she's going to mm. have dancers or she's going to have any combination of the three with some uh, visual effects pasted over the screen. And who knows what else? A mm. 3D tower that comes out. Wh- of the- hey, whatever they could do to get Miss Girl into the final. Come on, Poland. Right, on. exactly, exactly. So I, I felt like it did indicate a little bit of what we might be able to expect based on what we did not see, which was a like super powerful physical uh, performance. They're yeah. going to be like a camera angle type of a performance. Mm-hmm. That's where like the en- she, the energy is not going to come from her. They're going to make the everything else happen around her. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, I mean... I'm excited. I'm excited to see. I don't know if Barcelona films theirs or what. I, I don't remember really seeing stuff last year, but um, I don't think Amsterdam does either. But I'm hey, if all we get is is Spain, I'm I'm fine with that. Do you remember how Poland did a a? Yeah, they a, did, and it was a show that went on last for year? ages. It was like literally like a twenty hour show. They had oh so God. many artists at that thing. That is so funny. What's crazy also just one last thing on the pre-parties is like how many artists are doing the pre-parties. There was 30. It's 30. It's whole damn class. Yeah, it's only like 36 is competing. Like, uh, like I was sad to see Estonia wasn't there. Very sad yeah. to see them not there. Um, But I mean, it was nearly everybody, which is crazy. Estonia, Greece, um, Australia, and then like, you know, the shall not be named countries. And then that was basically it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that we have uh, finished covering all of the entries of this year and we are kind of starting to begin the season, I think it's now time that we kind of discuss maybe, you know, the shift in energies of Eurovision this year surrounding, of course, the situation in Gaza and Israel's participation in Eurovision that I just think for a lot of people in the fandom, us included, has just really kind of um, just shifted the way that we are feeling about the contest this year and the energy surrounding it all. And so in relation to that, uh, this week, there was kind of, I don't want to say finally, but I think, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk leading up to this. 
there was, you know, petitions about, uh, you know, urging artists to speak up about the situation, speak up about Israel's participation, you know, things here and there throughout the last couple of months, honestly, leading up to the contest. And so I think a lot of people were kind of expecting this to come, but we didn't really know when it it might come through. We didn't know who might sign it, you know, stuff like that. So we're going to kind well, of go... With with everything around the whole situation with Israel's participation, yes. it has felt like kind of everyone's just sort of been like waiting to yeah. find, like, are they in or are they out? They drug that out mm -hmm. until the very, very last minute. And so I think like they probably, you know, we didn't know if they were going to participate. So like they, you know, they, you 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 you're, you're expecting and hoping like most of us would that we would find out whenever that was in march that just they're not participating mm. and the contest is not going to be pulled into disrepute which is clearly what has happened ironically despite the fact that the ebu did not want that to happen specifically and all of the uh it all could have been avoided and the entire situation in in gaza would all mm -hmm. be avoided if people in power would just do the right thing and like put an end to this and yeah. so like it really is so unfortunate and and so it's required and it's required a response it's mm -hmm. a, a response has been demanded and we yeah. did get that response yeah and it is kind of unfortunate that um we had to get a response from like participating artists over even like the ebu or their uh, broadcasters or or the broadcasters or anything that it's kind of really fallen onto the artists so um this is the statement that uh came out a couple of days ago so in quotes mm -mm. we want to begin by acknowledging the privilege of taking part in eurovision in light of the current situation in the occupied Palestinian territories, and particularly in Gaza and in Israel, we do not feel comfortable being silent. It is important to us to stand in solidarity with the oppressed and communicate our heartfelt wish for peace and immediate and lasting ceasefire and the safe return of all hostages. We stand united against all forms of hate, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We firmly believe in the unifying power of music, enabling people to transcend differences and foster meaningful conversations and connections. We feel that it is our duty to create and uphold this space with a strong hope that it will inspire greater compassion and empathy. And this was signed by Bambi Thug, Gote, Yolanda, Megara, Nemo, Ali Alexander, Saba, Sylvester Belt, Windows 95 man, and uh, after the uh, statement came out, Musti also signed onto the statement as well. So then um, following uh, this statement, there were also just uh, from a couple of other artists, there were additional statements. Yeah, so we had from Bambi Thug, in addition to our collective artist statement, personally, I want to emphasize that my stance on double standards remains firm. As an Irish person with a shared history of occupation and a queer individual, I cannot and will not remain silent. I am aware of the calls to withdraw, but stepping back now would mean one less pro-Palestinian voice at the contest. My heart and solidarity has always has and always will lie with the oppressed, and I remain committed to supporting and using my platform to raise awareness and advocate for change, XX Bambi. Yes. And then also we had Ollie Alexander's additional statement, which was also a response uh, to the to Queers for Palestine, which had a uh, open letter towards Ollie uh, that was signed by 450 people for Ollie to withdraw. So this was Ollie's a uh, response that was sent to them, and he also posted it um, as an additional statement to the other statement as well. Uh, so he said, I wholeheartedly support action being taken to demand an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza, the return of all hostages, and the safety and security of all civilians in Palestine and Israel. I know some people will choose to boycott this year's Eurovision, and I understand and respect their decision. As a participant, I've taken a lot of time to deliberate over what to do and the options available to me. It is my current belief 
that removing myself from the contest wouldn't bring us any closer to our shared goal. Instead, I've been speaking with some of the other Eurovision contestants, and we've decided that by taking part, we can use our platform to come together and call for peace. I hope and pray that our calls are answered and there is an end to the atrocities we are seeing taking place in Gaza. I'd like to thank the many signatory signatories of this letter whose work I deeply admire and respect and hope that we can continue to work together in creating a better world for all of us. So obviously the individual statements are a lot more specific. Like mm -hmm. we can tell when we read them all at the same time that that first one, which had multiple signatories, is like shredded beyond belief from whatever their original draft may have been. Like mm -hmm. you can you can even kind of see some of the like words and phrasing where it's like, OK, this was the part that they agreed could come from like Ollie's statement. And mm -hmm. this is the stuff that Bambi wanted in that couldn't be in uh, because it it was like you could tell the first one was written like by lawyers is what it yeah. sounds like it sounds like because it plays both sides equally um and just it's so it was so like overly pr if i'd um yeah it is kind of it's it's kind of weird like reading these all over again and seeing them and just i do it's strange that yeah, it's strange that the actual artists have to put out statements like this um, because in the end, they don't really have control over situations that are going on. And I don't know, it's it, specifically that one is so PR that like that's like what you'd expect a brand to come out with if McDonald's yeah. made a statement, you know. And something else that we don't know is like, it's not just that the artists don't necessarily have control over like external things that are happening in the world, but we don't know how much control they actually have over their mm -hmm. involvement in the contest. Uh, as far as I know, and I did ask people on Twitter, like, have we ever had somebody openly talk about what was actually in their participation contract? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. is it even possible to withdraw? Mm -hmm. Like, do do they make the penalties for withdrawing so great that it would like you, that, that you could, you, you would, your like life would essentially uh, be over. Like your career would be over. You wouldn't have any money. You'd spend the rest of your life paying back some like legal debt because yeah. you broke a contract with a record label uh, because that does ruin people's careers. Mm -hmm. um, so like how trapped do some of these people feel in their participation in the contest? We don't actually know that right now. Um, and even beyond that, did these people sign non-disclosure agreements? We don't know. And that's the thing about non-disclosure agreements is it's not like you go out and talk about how you signed an NDA <laughs> and you say, actually, I can't really talk about that because I signed an NDA. I mean, I think technically you can say that, but I don't think it's something people necessarily yeah. want to broadcast. So like if people, maybe if people ask the artist directly, like, like about it maybe they'd say something maybe they wouldn't maybe they would deflect like like there's a line in ollie's about like um it's my belief that removing myself wouldn't bring us closer to a shared goal is that really true or is it just like a, you know it's a plausible thing to say when actually he can't leave the contract because he's gonna owe his record label you know 2.5 million dollars for everything uh that they put into his song uh, we just we yeah. literally don't know those things um so there's a, and like you had said like a lot is getting put on these artists who don't necessarily have a lot of power in this situation yeah yeah and i think that's a problem ev th throughout every single level of the conflict obviously people in gaza have been made completely powerless homeless starving mm -hmm. Uh, you know, familyless. You know, they're losing everything. Yeah. Um, and the ripple effects that that has through everyone. Everybody feels powerless. We, we as just like normal people, fans feel powerless because there's nothing that we can. There's very, very few like tangible things that we can do regarding what's happening and 
what's happening with the contest. Like we've tried, like how long had yeah. it been? Like at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the escalation of the conflict back in October, November, people were like signing letters and yeah. trying to put I mean, pressure on the people before we even knew who the artists were. And it's like this yeah. trickle down of power when really change should be coming from the top up. And it's just like, it's it it never should have gotten to the point that artists had to be writing these statements, but mm. it did get to that point. And what we have currently right now are the statements. That's what we have. And so another statement that I thought we should read is the statement that came out after those artist statements came out, which came from Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. This is part of BDS movement. So they said, PACBI, a founding member of the largest Palestinian coalition that is leading the global BDS movement, welcomes the refusal of nine Eurovision contestants to remain silent. However, by participating in Eurovision alongside apartheid Israel, while it carries out its live stream genocide against 2.3 million, million Palestinians in Gaza, armed and enabled by many European governments, the contestants would be complicit in art washing these crimes. Feigning symbolic gestures of support while dismissing the call of the oppressed reflects a patronizing and colonial attitude on the part of the contestants that is familiar to Palestinians and many oppressed communities globally. Israel is defying the World Court and the UN Security Council. This means everyone has a responsibility to end complicity in supporting or covering up his crimes. We call on all Eurovision contestants to withdraw from the contest as a meaningful gesture of solidarity and to fulfill this moral responsibility to do no harm. I think, yeah, it's really hard because after, um, like you said, we don't know what is in their contracts. We don't know what is uh, actually realistic to expect from these artists. And I feel like it's not like you're asking Beyonce or Lady Gaga or like artists that have well established careers that have the money that have the ability to really do and say what they want like you're not going to end their careers these are people who I mean a lot of the time if people don't realize most of the time Eurovision artists after Eurovision bro they just go back to their day job they just go back to what they were doing beforehand they don't see global superstardom. They don't have power in the music industry. They don't have anything. A lot of them. Some of them are 17 years old. Yeah. They're yeah. not even I mean, legal adults. Their parents could be the arbiter of what they do. Yeah, exactly. And so I feel like people maybe expect way too much from these artists in what they're able to do. Um, and then also... I mean, I hate to say it's too late, but the this push needed to be before all the artists were selected. You know, like these national selection artists, when they won their selection, that was the time. That decision needed to be made of what as to whether or not they'd be going to Eurovision, because that's when they signed that contract is when they win. Not whenever I mean, because we've seen time and time again now people win their national selection and choose not to go. Um, and, and a lot of the time that does uh, result in the country withdrawing. Um, and those were the times to really push on the artists to make that decision um, and on the countries to also, you know, make those decisions. And like a month ahead of the contest when like everything's already finalized, when the album's already sold and out, you know, like, Things like that. There's uh, a lot of things that the artists don't really have any control at this point. I mean, they're already touring. They're already doing the pre-parties and stuff. It's like really kind of impossible for them to do anything at this point. So then, uh, I, and this is the hard thing is the artists are never going to be able to do, make the perfect decision. You know, they could, because yeah, they're, whenever Windows 95 Man won, right? And they, they were being kind of open about these conversations, which was a lot different than maybe anybody else that we've seen. 
And they were being very honest about their feelings towards Israel's participation in Eurovision, how they didn't believe that Israel should be participating and that they would be, you know, having these conversations and I, I guess working on something like, like this. Um, and I think a lot of people, of course, were calling for them to uh, choose not to go to Eurovision and to cause Finland to withdraw. And ultimately, they made the decision to go because they felt like, you know, they would have more reach actually on a platform at Eurovision. Whereas if they were to withdraw, then they would just be these random people that uh, withdrew from their national selection. It really wouldn't make much impact. And, and like, I get that perspective too, but I also get the perspective, like, I understand that because... Yeah, it is true. Like you will never have the level of reach that you will have on like the lead up to Eurovision, like Eurovision week. That's going to be the most, the time where you have the most reach and the most impact. Um, at the same time, you know, I really don't believe that any of the Eurovision artists would have actually had to have withdrawn in the end. I believe that if we were it, able to get a couple of countries to threaten withdrawal, then that would have been enough. Uh, and so that nobody would have actually had to withdraw. So then none of that would have actually had to be an issue. That's like what I like to think, but you never know. I mean, we don't know. Yeah, we have no idea. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the EBU's whole thing is with keeping Israel in the contest. I mean, of course we know the sponsors and everything, but but I highly doubt that the sponsors are really the reason why Israel is still in the contest. There's no way. I I, I cannot imagine that what in the contract with Moroccan oil that it's a, it states, yeah, because we're an Israeli-based company, then you that Israel has to as long as Israel's in the contest, like we will be your sponsor, whatever. I would like, be shocked. I'd be absolutely yeah. shocked if that was in the contract. Yeah. If if they would allow something like that in the contract. Yeah. Yeah. So then I mean, I really I feel like those all those things that people are believing are really what's behind it. I don't believe so. I think, you know, unfortunately, what we're dealing with right now is a situation where a lot of the world still is very pro-Israel and a lot of the world's governments are. And so like expecting these national broadcasters to make those decisions that would often go against what the actual government of those countries uh, stance is, is just, I mean, it's just not, it's not realistic. It's not going to happen, unfortunately. And so and they made that very clear when the first comparisons with the Russian situation came out. Yeah. And it it was obvious that like, well, the reason that we all came out to get rid of Russia was because Russia was an enemy, except the difference now is that the person who is doing the bad thing is an ally. And so, yeah. and so again, it's the people at the top with the most amount of power making these decisions and like you said these are national broadcasters they the what sucks is that still it is a minority opinion to support the palestinian cause mm -hmm. it shouldn't be but that's what it is it is the minority opinion so like it would be and like it is good to go against like what it has been happening and there have been a lot of people at every level and even within governments it's just change hasn't been happening at the top mm -hmm. um so we it's not a surprise that national broadcasters would do nothing because they take their cue from the government which funds them um and then the artists can only do so much and they're all just kind of stuck in the situation that the ebu uh, that allowed to happen yeah, I think like, you know, the way I see it also is like the artists are the Starbucks employees and you wouldn't go to Starbucks and throw a drink in, you know, the Starbucks employees face and, and maybe, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying throw a drink, but you know, you wouldn't disrupt the actual employees lives, you know, you, you boycott starbucks by not going or whatever but you understand that those people are employees that need to you know they're just working their job and they that just because they work for a company doesn't mean that they agree or stand with the company's values and so you know 
these artists are like the lowest tier of people in the decision making. They have the least amount of ability to really do anything other than the most visibility. They yeah, have, they, have, they have the yeah. most visibility, but the least responsibility yeah. for what happens. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's important for us to put our emphasis onto the broadcasters and onto the EBU when we're making these decisions and um and the governments who actually are the in power to make yeah. these decisions, these funding decisions. Yeah. Um and one thing that I, I saw happening regarding like discourse around this was that a lot of people were saying once the statement finally came out, the statements are totally meaningless. And I initially was like I'm shocked to see so many people saying that making a statement is meaningless because words are not meaningless. Mm -hmm. And like, especially for artists, like that's what artists use for like their message that they're giving to people. They use words, you know, if, yeah. if, if words are meaningless, literature is meaningless. Um, mm -hmm. Like words are important. Words aren't everything. Words aren't enough. Um, and they do say that in this document, it says that they welcome the refusal of nine Eurovision contestants to remain silent. And what stands out about this to me is that it was nine, although I guess 10 once Moosey got added. So that's only a third of the artists actually signed on to the statement. Mm -hmm. I would love to see maybe more artists sign on to the statement and more unity about this and granted it is not enough but sometimes like if that is all you actually have if all you actually have is your voice like if these people truly are a hundred percent locked in on their contracts that they would that they just can't withdraw like then all that they actually have is their words and to tell mm -hmm. people that all that they have which is their words is meaningless is just like a little bit uh like it's just like a bridge too far. Yeah. Yeah. And I was definitely in that boat, I think. Like, I think I had the last uh, few days, like a really weird emotional up and down with everything. Because when I first saw them, I think I was feeling that way of like, this was pointless, um, unfortunately. And like, I think what I meant more so when I said that was more that in the statement it's like it was so much so you know not personal and so really didn't address anything specific um and you know it still used a lot of that language of like uh we also you know the safe return of hostages and, you know, right. stuff like that, that like, you know, is a lot of the time still the language that people would use that are like pro-Israel, you know, like it could mm -hmm. go either way. But then the more I kind of like saw and understood uh, and like look and reread the statement and realized, you know, yes, the acknowledgement of the occupation, yes, the like acknowledgement of Palestine and like even just mentioning it is so controversial still. And so and then seeing, you know, them at the pre-parties with the the pins and everything. It's, you know, it was nice to see, especially in that moment, because the head statement had just come out that morning um, and seeing everybody kind of unifying together in that sense. Um, but I don't, this was the issue which then connected to me, which was the way people will never accept anything no matter what you say you can we can be complaining about there not being a statement and then you put out a statement and now we're mad because the statement wasn't perfect because the statement didn't say enough if the statement did say a lot then maybe they would have said too much uh you know and maybe something would have not been said that was right you know like it's just like it and some people like, will only be satisfied with withdrawal yeah as well where like they won't accept any statement whatsoever other than i'm dropping out of the contest yeah um and and so then like this was uh kind of like how i was feeling i think this was like my realization because uh not that it was the same at all not that it was even the same situation but like i kind of like felt that afterwards where i was like oh this has got to be how the artists feel in that sense where you feel like you're 
um, you know, you're speaking from the heart, you're saying, saying what you believe in, um, but you also are feeling like, you know, you're doing what people have been wanting you to do, which was to make a statement was to speak out, you finally do it. And now everybody's, you know, mad at you. Because I made a Twitter post about how there was also a lot of um, anti Semitism that I was seeing against Tally, which was insane. I mean, the stuff was that was coming Q-Anon out about QAnon level, QAnon level shit drawing stars of David over the positioning of her dancers as they do a circle around yeah. her. Yeah. It was truly some like red line connecting There's dots. There's blue light, which Psychotic means that's shit. the color of the Israeli flag. So therefore, and, this is, you know. And that had been a, it had happened throughout her whole process too, because I remember after everyone realized this, that Tali Eshkali had done the production on the Luxembourg contest, people were straight up saying like, Jews control the media conspiracy theories. Yeah, yeah. And so like, I kind of, once I started to see, you know, because I I definitely like, a, once again, like I've been having this such a back and forth like feelings about everything because I was definitely one of those people that piled on to the tally hate. Um, and I was upset and I'm still like uncomfortable with her dedicating her song to her bro- her brother who's in the IDF and like all that, that still makes me uncomfortable. But I kind of realized like as six months, maybe not six months, five, four months, have like months have passed by. And she really, I mean, she went on to do an interview where I felt like she spoke pretty candidly about um, the situation, about the song, about the origins of the song, about how it came way before uh, the October, you know, attacks. So I just feel like I was like, at a certain point, I stepped back. I saw all that stuff in front of me. I was seeing so much on my timeline. And I was like, she really hasn't done I mean, nobody deserves to experience that regardless, but she really hasn't done anything to like have to experience that and to have to go through all of that. And so I made a post about that. And then it was just suddenly like, I mean, there was like literally hundreds of quote tweets saying, you know, just everything from that, like anything, anytime that I've ever spoken about Palestine, that that was all performative and fake and that like, I didn't believe in that to people all like fully suggesting that I'm a Zionist in disguise. And like, um, I, what made me uh, like, finally just step back and be like, oh my gosh, like this is just getting to be a level where we are losing the plot. We're losing what actually we are standing for. We're losing on what what the goal is and i'm seeing like friends of mine like these weren't faceless profiles that were saying these things they were like people that i know people that i like respect their opinions and stuff and um them adding on to this and i just kind of like finally stepped stepped back and i was like you know i don't need to be on twitter anymore I don't need to do that anymore. Not right now, not with everything, because like these artists, you know, you can say the most, you can do nothing, but like, especially to the people that say the most, like these are the artists that are saying something and maybe it's not enough by your standards, but they're the only ones that are saying anything. And yet they're somehow the ones getting the most attacks um, from even the side that we should be, Together, we should be working together towards our shared goal, right? But they're getting the most attacks, not the people who haven't said anything, you know? So I felt like that in a way because I was like, I was the first Eurovision blogger to like denounce Israel. I've been probably the most vocal about it, at least like on my social media platforms, and denouncing Israel and and speaking about everything going on, you know, because most people are like actual, you know, journalists that maybe, you know, they, you know, they have teams and everything. Things have to go through more people. But like, I've been one of the most vocal. And then to get that response was just a little shocking to me. Um, not what I expected. And not that maybe everything that people were saying wasn't, uh, it was 
some of it was correct for sure. But it just, you know, kind of made me sit back and, you know, see the perspective of the artists and realize like, we should be working together in this, you know, like we definitely shouldn't be saying that you're a Zionist in disguise when you're, when I'm so clearly not. Um, it just got, was getting a little bit, uh, a little bit much. So I had to delete my Twitter, um, probably for good. Not going to lie. Um, sorry, I just needed to uh, talk about that because that was weighing on me. Well, yeah, and I feel like this is another example of how like the EBU has allowed the situation re regarding around participation to get so out of hand that the fans who I, who I'm starting to believe that the EBU does not consider like Eurovision fans to be significant in any sense at all. I wonder if they had done a study and said, actually, Euro fans are so small that we don't give a fuck what they say because they whatever they say, whatever they do is not going to impact our viewing numbers because most of our viewers are casual viewers and they only tune in literally on the day when it happens because they just have their TV to the channel. Um, so it might have been their calculation that it doesn't matter what happens, but like they have this situation has shredded like any sense of like cohesion or civility within the the fandom and it has made it like i am the least excited about this year because of all of this like i was mm -hmm. i went out recently with um a friend and their girlfriend and they had one of their friends with them and she had said that she had lived in England, um, I think it was between like 2009 and 2012 or something, something like that. It was like in the two, 2000, 2000 teens. And um, she said that she loved watching Eurovision when she lived in England, but she hadn't watched it since she came back from England. Mm -hmm. And instead of being excited and saying, oh, well, you, you, you have to watch this year. It's Eurovision season. There's this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 blah. this song and that song. I was like, you know, this is not the year to get back into it if you were thinking about getting back into it. Um, yeah. Because the situation is just so bad. Like, if, if you're not part of it, don't be. Because I don't see, like, the the uh, so much enjoyment has been allowed to be sucked out of it by this destructive force, which seems to just bring so much destruction. Oh, yeah. wherever it goes. Yeah, and it really, it brings out the worst in everyone, I feel like. And like myself included in that. I'm including myself in that. I think like, I've really, like we've, I can speak for myself and I feel like it's probably what's going on with a lot of people. But it's just, I think as time has gone on, and we all begin to feel so powerless in the situation. We all begin to uh, get more angry, which I think is good. I think we should be angry. I think that we should be, um, you know, upset and we should still be vocal about everything. Um, but what ends up happening is like, that seeps into every aspect of your life. You start being negative to the people that you should be, uh, you know, loving and should be with and should be we should all be at least coming together in this and you know uh those of us who have uh you know shared views and and shared goals should at least be coming together on some sort of common ground and it feels like there's just none of that it just feels like the everything is being uh torn apart and so it's really it's becoming difficult to go through the season um and then all those things together you know and this is the whole point i guess is like at the same time then i'm sitting there you know reminding myself well you know it's silly that these are the things that we're worrying about it's you know when you think about the big issue at hand and you know it's people's lives um and an entire group of people uh you know experiencing a genocide you know why do i care so much about something like eurovision um 
or like even silly Twitter fights. But, um, you know, I think it affects everybody in different ways. And, you know, these are the things that, you know, Eurovision is such a big part of our lives. And do you know who it doesn't affect, though? People who don't care. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of people who straight up don't That's care. That's true about what's happening in Gaza. And that's another kind of aspect of this where like the whole dynamic has been very weird about people who who actually say, who actually do in their heart of hearts care. Um, because yeah. people who, who don't care, who don't make statements, who just ignore it completely, they're just off enjoying Eurovision. I know, yeah. I'm not saying that's a good thing. Yeah. But that, that is like a fact. Um, yeah. So the people who don't care re basically receive no negative, and the people who do care um, are like losing out on uh, something that like used to be important for a lot of people. Yeah, and um, I also just want to say to any like media or anybody going to Eurovision, talking with artists, interviewing artists specifically, um, because there was also something that happened this week with Celia Capsis, who is 17 years old, and um, an Israeli blog, um, I'm not sure what, what blog, I don't, we don't need to give them any clout anyways, but they, you know, they just probably did the thing that like is very common, which is like, oh, you know, shout out our country shout out our you know what do you think of israel's song whatever um and of course you know like when you as press when you come up with a camera on an artist's face like guys have more respect and understanding towards these artists like i feel like regardless of what side you're on like obviously that's a pro uh israel stance um but also like as a person maybe on the other side, like I wouldn't go up to artists and be like, you know, what's your statement on Israel participating? Um, because you're putting these artists in situations where they, they, they can never say the right thing. And, you know, Celia is 17 years old. She's a teenager. And I saw a lot of people putting like being like, oh, the delegation should have never let this happen. I mean, yes, she should be being uh, having her delegation around her whenever she's doing interviews. But I'm just going to, you know, tell you guys right now as a person who's been in those situations many times, um, a lot of those times the delegation is not around them. A lot of the times the delegation is uh, off doing something else or they're talking to other press people while you're giving your interview to them. And then they they pop over and they say, hey, time's up or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. When I uh, interviewed Victor Vernikos, I mean, they were in the same room, uh, his parents and everybody, but they were all the way on the other side of the room, you know, and if I were to put him in a situation where I'm asking him a, a question that he shouldn't be answering, like, you know, as press and as especially adults interviewing people who are under the age, uh, you know, have some consideration for the people that you're talking to, because just don't put them in those situations where you can hurt them you know it, it's just like you're putting her in a situation now where she's being ridiculed online and attacked for something that she probably just was like trying to be uh a, like just nice just oh i love everybody you know whatever but you put her in a situation now where she's being attacked you know um so i just you know people need to have a little bit more thought care and responsibility when they're in those situations too about this because i know we want we all want to be our little hard hitting journalists in those moments, but also just, you know, especially the fan media guys. Yeah. Like, and I always hated questions like that too, where we're basically where the only they're you're telling them what you want them to say for the camera. When you mm -hmm. say like, oh, what do you think of our country song? What you're saying is say something nice about our country and our country song. Like, mm -hmm. and I think probably a lot of 
artists too, if they haven't had really good media training and maybe, maybe like Ollie has had good media training because he's been in the industry a long time. Um, but this is something I know that they have to do with like sports with athletes because athletes aren't like the smartest people and they'll just like answer questions. <laughs> so they need to get like a lot of media training to like know how to like handle situations. Um, but a lot of them, I wouldn't be surprised if because they get asked a lot of these questions all the time that they just kind of go into like a default mode and they absolutely do understand the question of what do you think about my country as this is the part where you say something nice about how much you love my country and yeah. they're not thinking about which country it actually is they're just they're like not to compare the artists to dogs but it's like when you condition dogs to to jump when you tell them to jump mm-hmm like it, they, they're just going to do it. They're going to, they're going to do that. It's almost like Zoolander. Maybe that's a better comparison because it's actually a human subject, but like with mm. Zoolander where they just like, they tell him like, you're a monkey, Derek. And then yeah, you're a monkey, Derek. You know, when you say, say something nice about Greece, they say something nice about Greece. I love Greece. I love Opa! Greece. Yeah. Who doesn't <laughs> love Greece? But um, yeah, I, I wish that uh, people wouldn't put, artists in those kind of like weird it's like it's literally a leading question and it's like also like the in-person aspect too when someone's in your face you know you kind of like feel like you need to go along with what's what's happening in front of you um so Yeah, but I'm sure this isn't going to be the end of the conversation. Um, There's going to be protests that are happening. Maybe we will have a withdrawal, although I did ask uh, on Twitter, like, have we had withdrawals in the past? And all of the withdrawals seemed to be around different kinds of circumstances. Like, it didn't seem like there were really, like, personal political withdrawals in the past. Yeah, and I mean, I really can't think of many that, I really can't think of many at all that happened like this close to the contest. The only one I can think of is Romania um, when they were disqualified like the week of the contest, which was insane. Oh, yeah, because they owed money, right? In 2016, yeah. Literally the week of the contest. I remember Lydia uh, Isaac from Moldova singing, like serenading a song. Like, uh, I mean, that was kind of interesting, though. Because I remember a lot of the artists all coming together and being like, this is unfair. Um, And so it's interesting that everybody was able to, you know, come out and say that, which like that was against the EBU. I mean, like that was the against the EBU's decision, you know, because that was their decision to to disqualify them. But it was kind of fucked up (laughs) Um, because it wasn't anything that he did, you know, but um. I, yeah, it's, it, I mean, as we go along, there's going to be a lot more to talk about regarding what's going on with this contest and like the future of the contest. And like maybe maybe it will be a situation where when the spotlight really does come down on everybody, like maybe it becomes clear that like Israel is a pariah at this contest and they decide not to come back next year, you know, like shunning somebody from the lunch table. Yeah, I hope so. Um, My only thinking, honestly, at this point is that Israel could withdraw due to safety concerns. Um, Due to, you know, I saw some people thinking that they might not even show up and that it might be like them being allowed to do a live on tape. I don't think they would let them. I think that they would just be like, well, then you're out. Yeah, probably. So that's like the only thing I can really imagine happening, honestly. Um, But it's scary also, like, be safe, everybody who's going to these Eurovision events. I mean, you know, protest safely uh, and stay safe and, uh, you know, all that. But, yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, guys. Well, if you made it to the end of the episode, this is a long one today, but if you made it to the end of the episode, drop a watermelon emoji. 
Um, and yeah, guys, that is it for episode 29 of the Joint Slay podcast. Of course, don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel and as well as follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our Patreon, of course, so you can see the full length video episodes early release every single Thursday and all those extra little perks. And yeah, guys, uh, you can follow me everywhere at everywhere except for Twitter now at Maxi Rainbow. And I am at eSpotPod. And we will see you all next week. Goodbye.